The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webcast, Deploying a BIM Project, presented by Alice Craig Solutions Engineer with Hagerman & Company. We also have Chris Weatherford, Solutions, excuse me, Solutions Engineer with Hagerman, on the, on the line to assist with questions. This presentation is being broadcasted in a listen-only mode. You can ask questions by typing them into the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and Chris will address your questions throughout the presentation. At the end of the broadcast, when you exit GoToWebinar, you'll be prompted to fill out a short four-question survey. We ask that you take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. Also, this presentation qualifies for one continuing education unit through the American Institute of Architects. If you are a member of AIA and would like to receive credit for attending, please leave your AIA number in question three of the survey. Lastly, all attendees will receive a certificate of attendance and a link to the recording of this presentation. Alice, whenever you're ready, you may begin. I'm sorry, it looks like we're having um, a little difficulty with our audio. Please hang tight and Alice will join us in a moment. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Hang on. It says here that, can you see my screen? Um, we can see myself as well as the audience. Um, we can see your title slide that says deploying a BIM pilot. Okay, because it's giving me a warning saying that I've been kicked out of the meeting. So we're going to say, okay. Oh, goodness. Uh, if you wish to have others join, let me just close that. Okay, can you still see my screen? But if I go forward, can you see go forward? Yep, I can now see the agenda. Okay, well let's try it again. Okay, um, the broadcast has started so all the attendees can hear you as well, so you can just go ahead and move forward with your presentation. Right. Okay, thanks for dinner. I'm not sure what happened there, but all of a sudden the phone went dead, so we'll try this again. Um, so I'm Alice and I work with Hagerman. Um, which is your Autodesk reseller. So we're going to kind of go through a little bit about a BIM deployment and um, what that um, entails. And hopefully this little pop-up will stop coming up. I'll try canceling it again. Hopefully it won't uh, kill our presentation. So every day customers use, that use Autodesk, soft, use Autodesk software with over 10 million customers, um, you've probably seen some of the work that's been created by Autodesk software. Um, over um, either in design or in development um, over time. So let's take a look here. So some of the things we're going to take a look at today um, are going to be a little recap on what is BIM, and then we'll go over a framework for implementing BIM and planning a pilot project. We'll take a look at the next step once you have completed a pilot project and how to assess your current BIM level and planning for um, the next BIM project. And increase, in that, they'll help you increase your level of adoption. 
Building information modeling is an intelligent model-based process that provides value across the life cycle of a project. Although BIM has become synonymous with building design, the fact is that the definition of BIM is the same in every industry. The BIM process involves creating and using an intelligent 3D model to inform, communicate um, to decision makers. A, pro a process shift to building information modeling can fundamentally improve the way we plan, design, build, and manage uh, your building, infrastructure, utility, um, or natural resources. BIM starts with a 3D model, but it's much more than that. Whether you start with an existing condition or conceptual design, an information-rich model is key to realizing the benefits of BIM. With this rich data model, you can visualize I keep getting this error. Um, with data-rich model, you can visualize and simulate key physical and functional characteristics. You can coordinate project information, um, and you can collaborate with stakeholders. You can also build smarter, more agile um, processes that can help retain knowledge and support quality targets. With today's technology, it's possible to gather, produce, share um, immense amounts of data um, on a given project. However, information by itself is limited. It's what we do with that information, or as many refer to as the I in BIM, that really adds the value. And this is what sets Autodesk Solutions um, apart from traditional CAD um, or other technologies. Autodesk delivers advanced design and simulation technology in a comprehensive portfolio of BIM solutions through desktop, cloud, and mobile platforms. So the context and consistency are more effectively maintained through the life cycle of the project so that the right people are able to access the information anywhere and anytime they need to. And so that the information is able to be used or presented in such a way as to help achieve project objectives, be it visualization, analysis, or even coordination. Autodesk BIM solutions help empower project stakeholders to make better informed decisions and respond more quickly to the shifting project, business, and industry requirements with more accurate and actionable information. Artist BIM solutions support more efficient workflows and more accurate communication that help address project complexity. They help firms to compete more aggressively using simulations to optimize design and promote greater predictability. They use cloud and mobile platforms to help stakeholders get the information they need when and where they need it so they can respond more quickly to changes that might impact the project outcome. They put vast amounts of information in context to better inform decision making. The other advantage is that they are backed by a global network of partners, developers, training centers, and consulting services. Artist BIM also, uh, solutions also offer proven technology, a comprehensive BIM portfolio covering conceptual design and planning, to detailed design, engineering, fabrication, um, construction through operations and maintenance for buildings, and infrastructure projects also. There's greater business agility uh, made possible with desktop, cloud, web, and mobile platforms along with most cost-effective suite packaging uh, to help firms with varying staffing needs. For successful implementation of them, the following things need to be in place. A vision from executive leadership of what the BIM process will achieve for the organization and what this evolution will look like at various stages. Executive leadership must be capable of positioning BIM within the strategic objectives of the entire organization. This is not always an easy task when executive leadership often is only aware of the overreaching benefits and not the necessary tasks to set up implementation and train staff. 
The BIM leadership team must ensure that the BIM vision is translated into actionable tactics uh, to produce the desired outcomes and performance in line with an organization's strategic objectives. Leadership should look at the following. Actions by executives and BIM leadership must be accompanied by assessment, education, standard de standards development, and change validation to bridge the gap from executive vision to daily reality. A high-profile communication plan demonstrates to all stakeholders the organization's commitment to BIM and helps to inject energy into the transformation. Adoption of BIM technology requires new skill sets and new ways of working, and that demands an investment in training to ensure you have the right people on the right project at the right time. BIM tools and their associated processes can impact the contractual relationships between owners and their delivery partners. BIM enabled collaboration is a significant change to traditional work processes, which should be addressed up front with all project stakeholders. Project reviews permit BIM leadership teams to evaluate and measure the effectiveness of the BIM technology, standards, and processes in a pilot project. BIM leadership can catch errors, improve standards and processes, and replicate best practices. BIM leadership will determine key indicators to measure the organization's progress toward the goals and milestones laid out. One useful set of measures for BIM can be the BIM maturity, which measures an organization's capability to perform BIM within the organization on its projects. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. With the groundwork done, you have assessed your current workflow and you've planned out what you will need to do to become proficient in the new workflow. Now you're ready to implement the strategies that you have planned and apply them to a project. It's time to pick a pilot project. The project that you select should be a simple, repeatable project, something you've done before. You, don't, you want to have a single dimension of learning. You don't want to use new software on a type of project that you've never done before. A pilot should include measurements at key stages to really understand how BIM has improved the design and or construction process and what areas in the process need further development. The positive benefits or bottlenecks to each stakeholder in the process should be documented for further evaluation at the completion of the project. A few tips on picking a pilot project. The firm, <coughs> firms want to find a BIM project that they can complete. The faster and better they complete them and the higher and higher they return higher return they'll get, excuse me. Just like moving from um, 2D CAD from the auto just like from moving from the drawing board to 2D CAD, moving to BIM may initially lead to some drop in productivity um, while you're mastering the system. I generally tell customers if you're truly focused on um, working with BIM, you're looking at probably anywhere from three to five projects before you regain all that productivity. It's recommended that the initial project team does not work on traditional 2D CAD projects and BIM projects simultaneously. Um, this could be counterproductive to learning the new system. The intent of the BIM deployment workbook is to provide a framework that architects, engineers, surveyors, civil engineers, contractors, and owners can reference to deploy building information modeling um, processes and best practices. I will have the BIM deployment workbook for you um, at the end of this presentation that you can see where you can access it. The workbook is divided into two sections, the organizational BIM plan and the project BIM plan. The organizational BIM plan helps companies implement the BIM methodology at the organizational level, while the BIM while the project BIM plan um, helps project teams implement BIM on a pilot project. So let's first take a closer look at each of the workbooks. <clears throat> there are a series of forms in the organizational section of the workbook to assist you in gathering information on your current workflow and processes. 
Um, the current authoring tools, this is where you'll go in and fill in what your current authoring tools are. What is your industry focus? What tools are you using in the different phases? What's your current workflow and what tools are you using? So basically you're just filling out what tools do you have now and which ones are you are using so that you can better plan uh, moving forward. Planning tools. Um, outline the models that your organization creates in a typical project. What models, if any, are you using currently? Each form has examples to give you guidance as you fill these out. The planned analysis tasks. Which type of analysis tools does your organization plan on implementing? And this may be phased in over time. But you need to start somewhere, so fill in those that you're currently using and those that you might be planning to use in the future. What workflows does the firm want to use? Is it visualization, flash detection, quantification, energy, lead certification, or facility management? In this case here, I've got an example of visualization as an analysis tool, and then what products um, or recommended tools would you need to accomplish um, your goal? So our current skills. Um, fill in your organization's current skills by listing personnel type, number of employees of each type, average skill level. This will help you determine your staff's current skill set and necess necessity um, for training or any necessary training that they might need. So required skills are similar to your current skills, but we're going to fill in the skills that will be necessary for the different personnel. Um, the total number of employees, the desired skill level, and the number of employees that um, will need the desired skill level. Not everybody needs to know everything about Revit. You may have your um, BIM manager or BIM coordinators that will need to know information or Revit at a different level than your um, designer. Training plan and requirements um, for hardware, or training plan requirements and your hardware. Um, what training needs to need to happen based on the information that you've gathered? Don't forget to take into account hardware requirements. Um, of course, Hagerman is always here, and we offer a variety of training options from standard in-house training to custom training um, at our location or yours. So let's just gear to the BIM deployment plan. Project teams can use the BIM deployment plan as a collaborative working template for establishing project standards and alignment early in a project. The BIM deployment plan will also help your team define roles and responsibilities for each team member, what types of information to create and share, what kind of software systems to use and how to use them. Your project teams can streamline communication and plan more effectively helping to reduce costs as well as concerns about quality, scope, and schedules across all phases of construction. Once you have the legwork completed from an organizational point of view, it's time to drill down and pick an actual project. Select an appropriate project and talk with the decision makers. This is a team effort. Make sure there is buy-in um, from everybody. The BIM deployment plan also includes forms to fill out. These will assist you in your project planning phase. Outline phases and milestones. There's a table provided to outline the phases of your project, their estimated start dates, and the stakeholders involved. Identify planned models. Outline the models that, you'll be that will be created for your project. List the model name, model content, project phase at which the model will be delivered the model authoring company, the model authoring tool to be used, add arrows for any model types not already listed that you anticipate a need for. Detail out your analysis plan. For each type of analysis that you may be, may be performed for your project, list the models used for the analysis, who will perform the analysis, the file format required, and the tool to be used for the analysis. If there are special instructions associated with the analysis, mark the box and list the details in the special instructions document. Are there other things to consider, like file naming conventions, 
design review process, as built, BIM coordination, file locations. Now that you have a framework going, you can begin your implementation. If you need additional guidance or assistance, we're here, we're here to help you through um, the document, working through that documentation. We can come out and we can help you um, create that documentation for your assessment um, and, and uh, project planning, as well as developing an executable plan. So what happens once you've done that first project? You've gone in and you've done your process assessment. You've gone in and you've done an implementation plan. You've trained people that need to be trained. And you maybe even worked on your first project. And you kind of want to see where you're at. That's where the um, BIM assessment comes into play. And I realize it's a little hard to see. It's a pretty big document. Um, but once you've done a few projects, you can use the BIM maturity assessment to measure your current level of BIM adoption. And you can plan accordingly for the next project and BIM phase of adoption. So if you look at this little chart here, you'll see that it comes up and it has um, different topics and what description of what those topics are. And then you can choose in here where you are at in that process. So if I go back just a minute, you'll see here that the green ones are where they're currently at and the red is where they want to go. And it gives you a, an assessment of your current level, your target level, um, and the total possible um, points if you are um, always, all of them were at optimized. So depending on what phase you're at um, in this particular section here, right now they haven't implemented any of this um, BIM functionality, so they have some room to grow. So this can help you in planning the next steps um, in your BIM maturity. This level of maturity spreadsheet will take you through a variety of topics and descriptions, and they can be quite helpful. So some resources from um, this presentation here. You can download the BIM deployment workbook and the measuring maturity spreadsheet to get you started with planning your Revit deployment um, or checking your BIM maturity. You can use one of these links here, or you can simply go to our website events, and, um, go to this event, and then on the detail page for this event, um, it does have the download for um, both the documents. Chris, who's online with us also, um, he did a presentation a few months ago on the business value of them. Um, so this will also give you some additional information, not so much from the deployment side, but on the business value. And he does go into some past history that he has in deploying um, them, so it can be quite helpful. And then this presentation, once it's um, completed and posted, it'll also a link will be brought, provided to you also so that you can um, Watch this again if you would like to. At any time, we can be of assistance to you with preparing your first pilot project or assessing your current level of BIM adoption. We can assist you with evaluating the best set of tools for your company um, or have you help you lay out an implementation plan and how to get you started. So feel free to look through the documentation. If you'd like some further assistance, you know, please let your sales rep know and they'll be glad to um, have a technical staff talk to you further about implementing BIM or taking BIM to the next level for your company. At this point, I'll open it up um, for questions. If anybody has any questions, we can address those. And I don't have anything in the, uh, in the question box here, so if okay. uh, anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and type here. We've still got uh, recommended hardware. Um, Autodesk has a, uh, a page if you go to, especially if you're using building design suites where you're running uh, Navisworks, if you're doing any visualizations with 3ds Max uh, design, um, they'll have you know a, a listed you know recommended hardware, and you can also go through there uh, for specific hardware, uh, specific programs, um, just to make sure that you do have the uh, the base minimum uh, you know recommended system. So Autodesk has provided a very nice uh, interactive web page for that. And I think uh, Alice is pulling that up now. Yeah. So you just Autodesk hardware, certified hardware. 
and it will come in here and you can choose system hardware, graphics hardware. Um, I will say that you know if you have a brand new computer um, and you've got a brand new video driver, it may not be on the list, but if the previous version is on the list, um, you're probably going to be good to go. Would you agree, Chris? Sometimes yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's great to start on there. Uh, let's see, we've got some questions rolling in here. Uh, okay. The first one is, uh, we've got uh, an electrical project, this is uh, Derek Mosley, uh, we've got an electrical project that is uh, first pilot with Revit, uh, any suggestions for moving forward and first uh, our first steps for that one. Um, also, a request to touch on anything that's MEP related, which kind of dovetails into the electrical question. Um, I mean, I guess if it's your first project, again, planning is key. Um, if you want to be successful, I would definitely get download the workbook and kind of start laying out, you know, what what the goals are for the company and then what you're going to need to implement within Revit to meet those goals. Um, you know, some things will be, you know, for electrical or for MEP. You know, how do you want things to look? Not everybody wires up fixtures in electrical. Some people just show the fixtures and then. Um, don't actually show the wiring for the, the circuit. So you'll have to decide if you, know, if you want to do that and how you want that to look. Um, and or you can also, well, and, and also I wanted to jump in on that one. Um, okay. You know, the, the, the key thing on that is, you know, coordinating with your trades. Um, if you're the mm -hmm. MEP people, making sure that you are coordinating with, you know, any possible construction firms, that they understand them. Um, they know how the coordination process goes, um, you know, the meetings and things that go along with that to make sure everybody stays on the same page. Um, also working with your architect so that, you know, everybody, everybody is speaking the same language. Everybody is working toward the BIM project. Um, and we normally, I, I came from a large architecture firm, and we would actually, you know, source out those people that we knew were, you know, had a good track record with them, and we had a preferred list of people that we would, you know, send our bids to. So, you know, it really is about communication. It's about, you know, everybody understanding what their role is and knowing where your responsibilities end and somebody else's begin. So coordination is, is kind of the number one thing that I can, you know, kind of harp on there. And I would add to that early coordination because I think, you know, knowing what the, the goals and guidelines are going to be early on in the project saves an awful lot of headache um, down the road. Absolutely. Asking the right questions at the right time. Um, we also, uh, yes, I, the, the slides of this presentation should be made available. Um, and we also have a question about uh, recommended training classes for a novice designer. Um, we offer a several different levels of, uh, of Revit training, um, if it's just Revit in the program, um, you know, getting you used to the program itself, uh, both on the architecture side and the MEP side. Um, we offer training in both products, and we also offer, uh, if you wanted to get a little deeper into BIM, we've got uh, BIM management classes and BIM, management co uh, BIM coordination classes, uh, setting up templates, you know, doing those kind of things. Um, just getting kind of that base structure within your own uh, organization to be able to start and, you know, work on BIM projects without feeling like you have to start from scratch every time. So if that's, uh, if that's something that anybody's interested in, we can, uh, can definitely follow up um, with some yeah, more information about our training options. Right. And, that, and as Chris said, there's, you know, an architectural fundamental and there's also an MEP um, fundamental class, so they are separate. And then there's also a structural a fundamental class. And then the, the BIM management, setting up content, um, that has exercises in there for all the different disciplines. So it is a, uh, can be a mixed class or it can be just for a particular industry depending on um, how you want to handle that. As a new designer, if you're just wanting to get familiar with the product, then the fundamentals will be fine. As Chris mentioned, if you want to get more involved in setting up content and managing the content within Revit, then definitely the BIM management class um, there's another one that's a collaboration class, which I actually I recommend to everybody once they have an understanding of Revit, and that's how do you collaborate with, with other disciplines? Um, how do you link their file in and how do you manage um, the changes from one file to the next? So that's also a very, uh, very good class um, to take a look at. It also includes phasing, so if you have um, projects that you work with phasing or different design options on, which are probably going to be more for the architect, but they are available for anybody who'd like to attend. Um, 
and then if you're looking at a company-wide implementation, you know, sometimes a custom class where we go in and we work with different groups at different levels is helpful. Um, if you've got, you know, um, everybody starting from kind of from scratch, or if you've just got a few people who have a basic basic understanding um, of of Revit, and if you're not sure what you know what you need to migrate um, from the basic install to your company needs, you know, we can help you with that too. You can take these forms and kind of lay them out or you can ask us to come out and we can take a look at and, and do an implementation plan and look at your current drawings and see what would need to change in Revit to meet um, your current um, drawings and how they'll look and how you use them, section marks, elevation marks, text, um, line weights and so forth. And we can assist you with that if you want um, also. Uh, the next question we have here uh, is from Robert Ford. Um, in a growing NEP company, uh, how would you recommend dealing with the wide variety of BIM software that can be required by clients? Um, he states that they're working uh, in 3D AutoCAD uh, to provide the models. One client's interested in using Navis, and they're also being asked to do in Revit. Um, you know, the and I'll, I'll kind of jump in on this one. I'll let uh, let okay. Alice kind of jump in at the end here. Um, if you're working with Building Design Suite, um, they, they have several different flavors that are in, going to include a lot of these products. Um, with Building Design Suite Ultimate, you're going to get the, the Navisworks product, um, which is kind of the, it's, it's the program that most uh, people use for coordination, no matter what type of files you're using. It works with 3D AutoCAD, um, works with all of your Revit models, there's import and export dialogues. Um, the interface between those products has gotten a lot better. Um, for example, if you encounter a collision or a clash within your Navisworks model, um, it allows you to what's called switch back and open up the Revit model in that particular area, fix the issue, send the model back to Navisworks, and then show that the collision is dealt with. So if, um, you know, we highly recommend getting something that would get you into Navisworks Manage. Um, those will merge any type of file um, even, even you know, down to the fact of you can bring in, you know, other file formats from other uh, manufacturers, from Bentley, um, you know, if they're they're using MicroStation, um, you can import GIS data. There's a lot of different things that you can do with Navisworks on the coordination side of things. Um, so that's that's really where you know that that granular model, uh, the, what they call the aggregate model, comes from. Um, if you're working with a design suite, you're going to get a lot of these products. You're going to get your 3D AutoCAD. You're going to get your Revit. So you're really going to have, with the design suite, you're going to have a lot of that software that you're going to be required to use. Even if you don't know how to use it yet, we can get you there. Um, it's just getting the software and getting people that are accustomed to it and being able to get the work that, that requires that. Yeah, and I guess a couple of things that um, I, would add, I would add is that Oh, of course, that's off my train of thought. One of them is if you if you're primarily working in Revit, but you still have people who are requesting AutoCAD files, you can export out to those other file formats um, into, from Revit to AutoCAD or from um, AutoCAD MEP to AutoCAD if you have those um, needs. But moving forward, um, you'll have the tools that you need, as Chris said, because the suites come with a variety of products. And for those that are, you know, here Navisworks, but don't necessarily know what Navisworks is. As Chris mentioned, it's a collaborative tool. It's not a design tool. The design is going to be done in your MEP product, and then you're going to share that with other people so that they can bring it together in Navisworks, or you will um, bring others' files into Navisworks along with yours so that you can uh, do collisions. You can see the model as an aggregated mo aggregated model. Any other questions there, Chris? Uh, we had another one that just popped up. Um, why would you recommend uh, Revit over AutoCAD if CAD is a desired uh, deliverable? And part of the reason for that is going to be the fact that a lot of people are going to request that BIM model. They want the model. They have, whether it's uh, facility management, um, you know, what have you. However, that model is going to be used after the fact. Now, if your deliverable is AutoCAD, um, you still have a very rich set of export tools. Um, it exports a, a really neat, beautiful set of, of CAD drawings directly out of Revit. Um, requires a little setup if you're not just using the out-of-the-box settings, but 
you really do get, you know, neatly done, um, you know, what's almost perfect cat size um, out of the, the Revit product. So once you kind of break into that world of doing the, a BIM project, working with Revit, um, you're going to be much further ahead of firms that are just using straight CAD, but you're still going to have that ability to share those CAD files with the people that need them. So the other thing I would add, too, is not just the exporting functionality, but if you're working in Revit, you've got options to resize ducts. You can add in and automatically connect new diffusers. So there's a lot more automation in the Revit tool that will as you become more proficient with it, make it much easier to do your work in a shorter amount of time. So you can export that out to AutoCAD if a customer is not, is not requiring it in Revit. But if you were to do that same project in Revit, I mean the same project in AutoCAD, once you become proficient in Revit, it will be much more time consuming. So if all you know is AutoCAD right now, it's hard to, to visualize that, but it's so much quicker in Revit um, once you understand the tools and use those for adding con adding additional uh, content, connecting content, duct lines or pipes, uh, as well as, and electrical, as well as the ability to export that out if you do need it just in, the, in 2D. Well, and you're also going to get a lot of uh, scheduling and, you know, quantity information that you can pull yeah. out of the Revit model that's not going to have to be done as hand count. Um, yeah. You know, a lot less room for error. You know, you're going to be able to, you know, control your bids a lot tighter. Um, you know, your bills of materials, those kind of things. There's the, so there's a lot of benefits to doing it as a building information model rather than just straight 2D CAD. I'm going to add one more thing to that. You know, in Revit, if you add a diffuser, remove a diffuser, change the duct size, the schedules are automatically updated. You don't have to go back and manually change them. So you have you gain that that time. Um, also, and then you can simply export it again if you needed to. So it's much more efficient um, in Revit than it ever will be in AutoCAD. Go ahead, Chris. Exactly. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, another question here. In terms of providing BIM services uh, beyond the first projects, do you see the need for BIM services turning up? Uh, if so, how rapidly, in particular, to the construction markets? And I, I can kind of speak to some of that, um, sure. you know, having worked with a large architecture firm, we started to see more and more of that. The construction industry were actually some of the people that were driving some of these, these mm -hmm. BIM things. Um, they were the first ones that started using Navisworks for coordination and collision detection yeah. um, because they were able to get their projects done faster. And one of the things that, that we were actually able to do is we had projects that were still under a certain amount of design. Um, while they, they had things being constructed out in the field. So those timelines were almost running parallel so that, you know, those schedules can be adhered to. Um, you have far less change orders, um, you know, less work stoppages. Things can be, you know, can actually be done on schedule. So as far as the construction coordination, I just see those needs, you know, going up in the future. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, let's see, that was the, that's the last question that we have so far. Um, we'll stay here for just a few more minutes to, to answer any other questions, but I think we've covered just about everything that popped up in the uh, question okay. box here. Al. All right, yeah, we'll give everybody another minute. If you have any other questions, please type it up and we'll go from there. Anything that you would like to add, Chris, just in general from the presentation or from your presentation? Um, no, and I, I thought it was a good presentation, and I actually I had a few extra things that I had added just because I did have some case studies to, to throw in there. Uh, worked on several projects when uh, when I was working for the architecture firm in Chicago, and uh, that was that was really where I cut my teeth. Um, one one major um, you know hospital project that we had up there was the Rush University Medical Center. And, uh, you know, we, we pushed the customer to do them. Um, you know, they, they knew they wanted it, but they, they only wanted it a little bit. And we ended up, you know, it really, we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. But we also learned, you know, how, what the best practices should be there. And, uh, you know, we, we were able to carry that on. The, the lessons from each project, you need to do what's called a postmortem and go back and, and look at the things you did right, look at what you did wrong. Um, what could you do in the future to avoid some of those issues? And as you get more and more experience, um, you know, distribute those people. If you've got a project team that worked on a project together, they learned a lot of lessons, um, you've got several new projects coming up, seed those new teams with those experienced people so that they can bring the level up 
um, let them all go to training together, um, you know, let them kind of work on design exercises together so that everybody, you know, they, they bring each other's knowledge up um, kind of together there to where everybody understands a little bit more every project, you get a little bit better and a little bit more knowledgeable. Uh, let's see, we've got another question here. Um, the, uh, yeah, the assistance from uh, Hagerman as far as like them services, um, that would be a, a four fee situation. And, uh, you know, depending on how, what the size of your organization, how far you want to go with them, um, they do have, you know, different, different levels of support for that. And we can definitely get you some more information if you're interested in that. Um, the next question I have here is, can Civil 3D be integrated with Revit um, surfaces and pipe networks specifically? Well, it was a way um, you can link in, much like you can in AutoCAD, you can link in an AutoCAD file, which is Civil is still AutoCAD file based, so you could link that in, or you could use Navisworks. Um, to pull those two different files together, which is probably the preferred way of doing it. Um, you could bring in the civil file and the, um, the architecture MEP, whatever um, Revit files or AutoCAD MEP, AutoCAD architecture files, any 3D files that you'd like. You could bring those all together in, in Navisworks and view them together. Um, you can also run collisions if you've got uh, Navisworks managed. Um, in there too. So yes, you can underlay it in Revit, but a better um, workflow might be Navis work. Sure, and I, I've seen where, um, you know, utility tie-ins, um, you know, city sewer, uh, you know, supply water, things like that, were actually done in Revit, but yes, exactly like Alice said, they, you would bring in your MEP file, and it, it will allow you to do, you know, a lot of things below grade, um, you know, just be, being able to control the levels. And then once you bring the civil information in and kind of overlay those things, um, you can see where you might need to go back into your Revit model and maybe rearrange some things or you know, move something over if you've got clashes. Correct. Yeah. Uh, next question here. Uh, what are typical file formats provided by the architect for MEP BIM contact? Um, are they PDS, Revit, et cetera? Can you repeat that or does again? It I'm sorry. It depend on the architect. Um, uh, the, the question, question is, again? well, uh, what are the typical file formats provided by the architect oh. for uh, MEP contracts? And, you know, would it be, is it going to be PDFs, uh, Revit files, or does it simply depend on the architect? Um, you know, short answer on that, a lot of times there's going to be, you know, there's, there's going to be some kind of specific uh, item in your contract that specifies all models are to be done in this product um, here, and then list the exceptions. So a lot of times that, that's going to be determined by, you know, the, either the architect. Um, sometimes, you know, you can come to an agreement that, hey, we're using this, you guys are using this, is there any kind of compromise? Um, you know, much like the, the example that Alice gave previously. If the architect's doing things in Revit, but the MEP designers are doing things in AutoCAD MEP, for example, um, they can request that the architect send them those files. Um, but it really needs to be talked about in the very beginning. Early communication and having everybody on the same page at the very early stage of the project to avoid those edits. That is well, That is one nice thing about you know Navisworks is that if you do have an MEP working on AutoCAD MEP and an architect working in Revit architecture, and then you've got a Civil 3D, you know somebody. Uh, um, infrastructure working, then you can bring a lot together in Navisworks, and that is one of the nice benefits of Navisworks. You can have file formats of somewhere around 38 different file types um, brought together in Navisworks. Um, so that is one of the big benefits of Navisworks. So it really, like Chris yeah, says, it's early, it's early planning um, and deciding what everybody's going to use and how it's going to be you know, integrated. And we actually had a, uh, a coordination schedule. We had weekly coordination meetings that everybody exported their contributions to whatever file format um, on, like, say, Wednesday. On Thursday, the models were merged. Um, you know, later Thursday afternoon, the collisions were done. Uh, the punch lists and everything were generated. Friday morning was the coordination meeting. Everybody discussed what was on their punch list. Um, everybody had a game plan. And then, you know, the next, that controlled the next three or four days worth of work. So that was, you know, having everybody having those coordination meetings instead of going for weeks and weeks and weeks without communicating with each other, now suddenly we have a problem and now we've got to back up. 
Um, so that communication, you know, having those communication schedules and having everybody understand what they're responsible for and when can uh, can definitely help, you know, alleviate some of the headaches that you run into. Um, another another question I've got here is, um, do you see Revit modeling design as a remote opportunity to be performed for a client, or is it uh, Revit restricted to on-site design? Can you repeat that again? Because um, getting garbled. That's yeah, all right. Um, do you see Revit as a uh, Revit modeling design as a remote opportunity to be performed for a client, or is Revit restricted to on-site design? Uh, I, I would say either way. Would I understand yeah, the question? And it, yeah, and it just depends on you know the size of the model. Is it something that can be worked on on the laptop remotely, um, plugged back into the network? Um, you know, do you have multiple parties working on the project that yes, are located you know, in different mm -hmm. offices? So, you know, there's there's a lot of questions to be asked there, but it could work either way. Um, you know, I've I've actually been involved in Revit projects that were being done, you know, all the way across the country. We had a mm -hmm. you know a small contribution, like we maybe were working on the interior side. Um, we were able to in breaking up models, being able to link models together um, from the architects uh, architecture, structural, and you know, having a separate file that we link together so that we can see other people's contributions and not necessarily working directly on their model. So there's a lot of scenarios there, and uh, just it, it, it varies per project. Uh, that's all the, oh, let me see here. We've got one more. Uh, have we seen any any use of Revit with uh, highway, you know, linear style projects rather than just uh, a site? Um, I myself haven't seen a whole lot of that, um, only to where the infrastructure ties into wherever our project site was. So that's all I've seen so far with these. Um, not sure that, uh, that that Revit would be, you know, the right tool for like a highway design project. Um, yeah, because there, there's sales. actually a limit. Um, as far as how far you can have the model span in Revit. So it's really not in design for that. I mean, we, we looked at it because, um, well, we've looked at it for long strings of um, information as far as the geographical location, and it really does have some, some limits. So ideally, no, you'd probably do something more like civil if you were going to do a roadway, but then you can you can either take your Revit model and export it out and put it in a civil file um, so you yep, can see exactly. it if you wanted to see its location. And there's other tools out there for preliminary design like InfraWorks um, that you can export your Revit file and, and place it there. Um, or if you've got um, a civil layout, you can bring it in as an underlay, but again, you want to be careful about you know, how, how much of an area you're trying to cover. Yeah, because it's um, like Alice says, you do have, you know, there's there's not necessarily a base point, but the larger the project gets, um, you you start to at some point you reach that threshold where the project is so large I can't open my models. Um, so what we used to do is, you know, kind of a master plan. If it was a large site that had you know multiple buildings and it spanned a large site, um, we would have kind of a master model that we would have Revit models for each location. And then we would bring that together in either uh, an, an empty Revit session that we were able to import the terrain and then all the buildings. Um, there was no actual geometry there. You could still cut sections. You could still put cameras and look at different things. Um, but not, you know, it's still fairly lightweight model as far as Revit was concerned. Um, so there's there, there's a lot of different scenarios for that. But um, yeah, I would think that you know, civil. If you were doing a linear project, um, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just a single building or a complex there. Um, that, that you would need to look at a little bit different tool, but definitely for the architecture uh, items to be able to put into your linear project. Yeah, and again, you know, Navisworks another option too. Yeah. To pull them to both together in. Um, and I think that's all the questions. Ooh, excuse me, that we have so far. Um, stay here for just a couple of more minutes, but um, if. Uh, if we don't have any further questions, I'll turn everything back over to you, Alice. Sounds good. I think I think we've had several questions coming in, so I think we're good to, to go. If anybody has any one last question. 
let us know real quick and we'll hang on. Otherwise, I think we'll call it good. Thanks, Alice. This concludes our broadcast. Um, if any of the attendees have additional questions, you can just reply to the confirmation or the reminder email that you received from GoToWebinar, and we can get those routed to Alice or Chris to get your questions answered. And as a reminder, you'll be receiving an email containing the link to the recording of today's presentation. And um, when you close the session, you'll be prompted to fill out a short three questions sorry, four question survey. If you could take a few moments to do that, we would greatly appreciate it. So thanks everyone for attending and have a great day.